I will make a short excursion into the area of industrial chemistry. Fantastically important and very interesting field of ferrous metallurgy. Ferrous stands for iron. In Latin it's ferrum. Fe stands after manganese and before cobalt. The group is number eight. Metal iron happens as a mineral, but it's very difficult to find. It also exists as meteorite iron. Meteorites that are coming to surface of our planet consist overwhelmingly of nickel iron alloys with around 5% of nickel. But that's very easy way to detect this source of iron. Some of these pieces, like Cape York meteorite, are enormous, as heavy as 50 tons in total. They were used by humans long ago. There are plenty of minerals that contain iron on the surface of this planet. Many of them are silicates and they are difficult to process. But some of them, so-called iron ores, are relatively easy. The best, perhaps, iron ore is iron oxide, Fe3O4 or Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus twice O4 magnetite, black crystals with octahedral Fe2 plus and tetrahedral octahedral Fe3 plus ions. Another mineral is hematite, iron oxide, Fe2O3. You can make even some beautiful things out of it. It can be really beautiful. Uh, hydroxo derivative from hematite, gutite. It can be also hydrated option. Limonite and siderite, iron carbonate. All these minerals are very nice iron ore, but in reality, the rock contains also large admixtures of sand, calcium carbonate, and other minerals. Making iron out of iron ore is a very challenging process. A melting point of iron at 1538 degrees Celsius is much higher than melting point of copper or gold or silver or antimony not even mentioning tin or lead. Iron with large carbon contain, so-called pig iron, has lower melting point, 1150, but is still higher than melting point of copper or bronze or brass. That's why Despite the fact that iron is widespread on our planet as mineral, as oxide or silicate, iron metal was not available for humans for a long time. Oh, little bit of history. Uh, natural silver, copper and gold 
were available for humans more than 10,000 years ago. The problem is, you can make beautiful jewelry out of gold. You cannot make tools. You cannot make needles. You cannot make knives. You cannot make axes. Same is true with silver. Well, you can do slightly better tools, but it's still very soft. Pure copper is also too soft to make decent tools. So, for jewelry, yes, 10,000 years ago humans used these metals, but that was very limited. Stone-made tools and bone-made tools were much better. Copper production, larger scale, out of copper ore, started around 8,000 years ago. And yes, these tools quickly became better than stone tools. Still, pure copper is not good enough. It was important to add something, and first additives were very toxic, like arsenic. It took another several thousand years until tin copper alloy came to a picture, that name bronze. That was around 5,000 years when Bronze Age started. On this continent, uh, copper, native copper metal was mined around 6,000 years ago, around Lake Superior, and uh, was a background of a very developed metallurgical culture. So, seven, seven, six, five thousand years ago, it was Copper Age in Europe, in India, and Southeastern Asia. At the same time, meteoritic iron was available, but its quantity was very small and high melting point made processing of iron very difficult. Smelting of iron started around 5,000 years ago, but the resulting metal was fantastically difficult to obtain and was of low quality. Real production of iron started around 3,500 years ago in several locations. India, Southern Europe, several others. And around 3,000 years ago, Iron Age started with widespread use of iron by major culture. This very term, this word Iron Age, was first coined 2,800 years ago by Greek poet Hesiod, and perhaps he was not the first to use it. So, how they did it at the beginning? The challenge was high temperature was necessary. Next, if you increase temperature too high and you have too much carbon in your iron, you will have big iron coming out of your furnace. And pig iron has very little usage. It bristles, it can easily break. You cannot make tools out of it. So, it was kind of black magic to make good iron tool. The starting material often was bog ore. So, the spring, when iron containing water was coming to the surface resulted in quick oxidation of iron salts to iron oxide, making Fe2 or 3 as a rust that was deposited as chunks of ore. Bog ore can be mined 
in practically all areas of this planet. It's widespread, easy to find. You can find it in Buffalo area, as a matter of fact, with no problem. What's next? A bog ore, together with charcoal and some additional materials, so-called slug, to remove impurities from bog ore, was put in a furnace. Next, uh, it was several inlets that allowed to add air for combustion process here. And then some ore was placed that was eventually reduced by charcoal to piece of very impure iron. In English, they named Bloom, and the whole device was bloomery. That's how it looked like. It's dirty. It's contaminated with uh, charcoal, with sand, and need to be processed by forging. Little surprise that any tools made of these small chunks of iron were very expensive. That's why finding a horseshoe brings a good luck to you, because horseshoe with a good chunk of already processed iron where impurities were rusted out. So the easiest way to make a good quality iron was to make a bad quality iron, wait until it will rust out, the impurities will go, and then reprocess it by hammer once and once again until after several cycles that may take tens and tens of years, uh, you'll have higher quality metal, which was fantastically expensive. Now, developed cultures made better approaches. First, high quality steel was crucible steel, made by melting pig iron, uh, that iron that melted out of your furnace that cannot be used to make tools. You can only cast it if you're lucky. Uh, iron, sometimes already used steel, along with sand, glass, ashes, and other fluxes in the crucible. This was literally art, but they made it. Uh, this is an example of practically stainless steel, no rusting, for 1,600 years. And this pillar is as heavy as six tons. It has inscription in Old Sanskrit, giving glory to some ancient king. But, uh, of course, it's glory for those Indian metallurgists who did it 1,600 years ago. Oh, crucible steel was used for so-called Damascus steel blades. Fantastic technique that was already old 1,200 years ago. Uh, the metal has very characteristic surface that is special for Damascus blade. But the main property, of course, was strands of weapons made of it. Well, you cannot make much of steel in crucible. Six tons, yes, but that uh, was for kingdom. For mass production, they needed simpler approaches, and one of them was blast furnace that came into picture around thousand years ago, arguably first in China. Uh, but uh, around 800 years ago, it was widespread in Germany and Sweden. The resulting product was pig iron. Iron with large contents, around 6% of carbon. 
I, it came out as a piglet, just chunks of iron that needed to be reprocessed. A usage of pig iron itself was very limited. You need to make steel. Nevertheless, uh, this is basic of uh, iron production. The most commonly used reduction process for iron takes place even now in a blast furnace. The raw materials requires are iron ore, coke, you remember coke is high carbon contained product, limestone that serves as flux, that it can be some other additives to improve the process. Uh, the, all these materials are loaded from the top and then there is strong blast of hot air coming on the, from the bottom. Carbon reacts with coke to make CO2. Calcium oxide reacts with silica to make calcium silicate and is removed. And now coke reacts with CO2 to make carbon monoxide. More and more carbon monoxide is made and it's coming to upper levels where reduction of iron occurs. So first iron Fe2 or 3 trioxide is reduced to Fe3 or 4. If you are lucky, you are already loading this as a magnetite. The next magnetite reacts with CO to make an iron oxide FeO. And the last step, FeO reacts with carbon monoxide to make liquid iron. It's Excess of carbon reacts with this iron, making a high carbon iron, which has lower melting point. So, molten iron comes out from one outlet. Slug, which is mainly calcium silicate, has lower density coming from different outlets. This is a normal construction, much larger than that ancient this picture. Looks something like this. It's very impressive assembly. Next step is making steel from pig iron or from steel scrap. This conversion process came into picture relatively recently. The first was Bessemer process uh, that started 150 years ago and uh, around 70 years ago it was replaced by better oxygen converter process in which Additional slug is added to metal scrap and pig iron and blowing of oxygen through the melt removes carbon to extent you want. Also removing impurities such as silicon sometimes phosphorus that you have in your melt and uh, they run away as gases. Oh, you can look at this converter. It can have around 30, 50 tons of molten metal. It run in cycles. The whole process takes roughly half an hour uh, the, this process is responsible for around 60% of steel we have these days. Uh, more expensive is electric arc furnace 
process. There is possibility, of course, of direct reduction of iron process uh, that is smaller scale, uh, still require better control and better quality ore. In this process, uh, you reduce iron oxide with carbon monoxide and hydrogen. All these results in metal. Uh, additional oxides of different metals are added to change composition. Iron itself can be in different crystalline form. One of them is ferrite, another is austenite. Uh, there are several other forms as well. As you see, it's all cubic, but different cubic. Uh, the carbon containing crystal is cementite. It has Fe3C composition, which makes 6.7% of carbon. And it's a basic component of pig iron. So it's not actually even iron, it's a different chemical compound. There are plenty of other chemical compounds. I'll just take a look at this scheme. Uh, what you have is a, a different crystalline phases. This is gamma iron, gamma iron. Uh, lower temperature gives you alpha iron. So crystallization at different temperature with different amount of carbon yields a different composition. Whatever is below 2% we name steel. Whatever is between 2 and 6.7 we name cast iron. And uh, above that, you have too much carbon and uh, it crystallizes separately, making the material very unstable. So, as you see, amount of carbon dramatically changes crystal structure of resulting material and changes physical properties. These physical properties change even more with addition of other metals. So, several important types of steel. Stainless steel contains 73% of iron, 18% of chromium, and around 8% of nickel. It's corrosion resistant and has numerous uses in industry and at household. Very hard is tungsten steel. 5% uh, of tungsten dramatically changes structure of metal and changes its properties. Uh, manganese steel with 13% of manganese is very common. Uh, magnetic properties are very special in alloy of nickel and iron. Most of steels will have some percentage of titanium, some percentage of uh, manganese. All of them have some percentage of carbon. All this area with thousands of known composition is fantastically interesting and very important for modern civilization.